All right, I think it's about time to get started. This is our final project briefing for uh, day two of the virtual event at the CNI Fall 2021 member meeting. And uh, this will be a panel, a uh, joint panel um, from the US and Canada representing some joint work that has been going on between in the in the ARL and uh, CARL context, uh, looking at um, institutional strategies and policies for dealing with research data. Um, this is a you know major um, source of um, investment and a major challenge for. Um, libraries, uh, every research libraries everywhere. And um, it, it's interesting to me to see the similarities and variations between the approaches that different institutions are taking. Um, we have an all star um, uh, group of panelists, and um, I'm not going to introduce them all because. Um, I believe the next slide is a um, slide listing all the panelists and their affiliations. Um, so I'm going to just hand it off to our panel, say welcome, thank you for being here with us, and I'm really looking forward to what you all are going to tell us. Thank you, Cliff, uh, and thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. My name is Jenny Mullenberg, and as Cliff mentioned, I'll advance the slide here. I will be introducing our panelists just real briefly, and then as each one of them speaks, they will reintroduce themselves and a little bit about where they're from. We have Donna Bourne Tyson from Dalhousie, Abigail Gobin from the University of Illinois, Chicago, Jim Wilgenbush from Minnesota, and then me from the University of Washington. The three first panelists will be discussing um, issues around policy and strategy development and research data services in their institutions. And then I'll mention a little bit about the ARL report that kind of uh, brought ARL and CARL together earlier this year. What we're going to be hearing are some of the experiences and lessons learned, lessons learned, excuse me, when adopting and implementing institution-wide policies and strategies, some of the use cases that our three panelists bring, and then um, some more information about the framework for research data services out of the ARL CARL report. So with that, I will just kick it right off to Donna Bourne Tyson. Thanks very much, Jenny. Could I have the next slide, please? So uh, yeah, Donna Bourne Tyson, Dean of Libraries. I was pleased to be a member of the ARL CARL RDM committee. And I'm speaking to you from Dalhousie University. Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. I'm going to very briefly cover how institutional RDM strategies have been mandated by federal funding agencies in Canada and how strategy development is being enabled by a national RDM network of experts and how the spectrum of services and activities from national to local is being considered in an institutional strategy. Next slide, please, Jenny. So the tri-agency, oh, sorry, um, yeah. Uh, the tri-agency in Canada, the funding agency is really three agencies combined for health, natural sciences and engineering and social sciences and humanities. Uh, known as the tri-agencies. And uh, next slide, please. Yeah, per, yeah. Um, the uh, RDM policy, which was issued by the tri-agency is the second step after the earlier open access policy was established in 2016. So the data management policy was promised and discussed over a period of five years with the library community and others. The tri-agency RDM policy was eagerly awaited by the RDM community as something that would draw attention to the benefits of RDM and the services offered at our universities. There are three requirements in the policy to create an institutional strategy for researchers to create data management plans and for researchers to deposit their data. The tri-agency policy requires an institutional strategy rather than an institutional policy, but it is acknowledged that there are governance issues that could be considered in an institutional data policy as an additional step. And Jim will have more to say about that later. Uh, next slide, please. 
So for over a decade, uh, research data management had been worked on locally in Canadian research libraries and also at the national level led by the Canadian Association of Research Libraries. Carl started developing Portage in 2013, a network of RDM experts and a national suite of services and infrastructure with support from librarians across the country. These librarians have been developing this national network while creating capacity at their own institution as well. By lending support to the national effort, there has been effective coordination and much less reinventing of the wheel. RDM capacity in smaller institutions has been easier to develop as well, drawing on the shared expertise. Next slide, please. Canada is in the process of setting up a national digital research infrastructure organization called the Digital Research Alliance of Canada, or the Alliance for short. RDM, advanced research computing, and research software are the three pillars of the Alliance. Next slide, please. Before the creation of the Alliance, responsibility for delivering Canada's DRI research infrastructure ecosystem had evolved to be a highly distributed uh, endeavor with many actors across multiple delivery layers and no formal mechanism to ensure coordination and planning. The Government of Canada saw the value of consolidating the related services and organizations, and along with other national organizations, Portage has been merged into the Alliance during 2021. Researchers have expressed a desire for a, ro a robust national DRI, but not at the expense of the funding available to them as researchers. This has been top of mind for everyone involved. Next slide, please. There are still several layers of national and regional cooperation, including CARL and the four regional academic library consortia and organizations in the DRI, such as Canary. But additional organizations, including Compute Canada and Research Data Canada, are now being merged into the Alliance as well. This strong national coordination combined with the regional consortia and a growing number of RDM specialists in each university ensures that no one is reinventing the wheel at the local level and activities are taking place at the right level to meet researcher needs. Next slide, please. So for RDM coordination, the name has changed from Portage to the Alliance, but the focus remains on creating researcher-focused capacity at scale. And this includes over 150 experts uh, at each uh, university library, and then a core RDM team of staff at, with the Alliance infrastructure and platforms, tools, services and policies, and training and outreach. And that training and outreach, and actually everything is available directly to a researcher or through uh, their RDM librarian. The uh, expert groups, oh, sorry, yep, perfect. Uh, the expert groups offer services, platforms, training and standards around the entire research data life cycle. And these all factor into the development of an institutional RDM strategy, and they should be the first consideration for developing something at the local level. Uh, next, please. Uh, several of the Portage expert groups have created services or infrastructure that specifically meet the requirements of this tri-agency RDM policy. These can be divided into institution-facing and researcher-facing requirements. For the requirement for an RDM strategy, there's a template to assist the university in the development of the strategy. This was co-developed by Portage, the Tri-Agency, and other agencies in the DRI. For the researchers, for the requirement to file a data management plan, there is a national DMP assistant, a bilingual online tool that walks researchers through the creation of the plan. There are exemplars and various discipline-specific templates available. Also for the researchers for the requirement to deposit their data, there are two repository options available nationally at no cost to the researcher and also guidelines on disciplinary and institutional repository options. Next slide, please. Uh, there's also support for institutional strategy development being provided in terms of workshops by the Alliance. Next, please. And uh, one of the things they're advising is that there's a university-wide team put together of key participants. In most universities, this team is being led by the library, often in partnership with the research office and including the IT group, the ethics board, and of course, researchers. Next, please. So there are sort of phases outlined towards the development of the strategy, uh, starting with an assessment of the current state of RDM. Next slide, please. 
and a tool has been developed by Portage and the Alliance, uh, a maturity assessment model um, that supports this assessment of institutional capacity. Are there RDM librarians? Are there storage and preservation infrastructure and tool options? What are the relationships with the research office, IT and ethics, and a consideration of relevant policies and university systems? Next slide, please. So at Dalhousie, we had the privilege to test drive the Portage Tri-Agency template for the institutional strategy when it was in a draft stage. And our strategy was approved in late 2019, well ahead of the 2023 compliance required. And Dell's fantastic RDM team has continued to refine our strategy to further develop aspects that were not originally given full consideration. Next slide, please. This has included uh, more consideration of the FAIR and CARE principles, uh, CARE principles for Indigenous data governance articulated by the Global Indigenous Data Alliance. And now we're considering and receiving training in the First Nations principles of OCAP from the First Nations Information Governance Center. Next slide, please. These OCAP principles of ownership, control, access, and possession don't always align with the FAIR principles uh, of open and uh, the OCAP principles must be given precedence working with the local Indigenous research community. We also have advice from the Government of Canada on other ways to decolonize research, which we are folding into our institutional strategy. Our strategy will always be an iterative process where we're assessing what researchers need to support the management of their data. Uh, and now I'm turning things over to Abigail. All right, thank you, Donna. Um, so I'm gonna take this a little bit different direction rather than talking about very much the large scale and the big picture that Donna's given us for all of Canada. I'm gonna talk very personally about what I'm seeing here at UIC and how that's a little different um, in the United States. So thinking about this, and as I was getting ready to tackle this, I was, I was thinking about like walking into a restaurant where someone asks you, how big is your data party? So next slide, please. Um, and also, I'm the data management librarian at UIC, and I'm also a data policy advisor for our Office of Research. So I hold um, joint positions within the university. When we're talking about identifying policies, needs, and librarian models, and how do we get people involved, and how do we engage with all of this, um, this is something I've been looking at for a long time. And so I have research on all of these areas for you to build upon. First, um, about five years ago, a team and I looked at institutional data policies, what's available. And my understanding is that we actually haven't changed all that much. I know UIC does not have its own research data policy yet. There have been some new ones. There are some others that were in our paper that are continuing to emerge and evolve, but that paper can give you a quick idea of where pol institutional policies are, what the best ones we thought were, and how you can build on those rather than having to reinvent. Something else that we've seen quite a lot of is curiosity about researcher needs. And in 2019, we looked at uh, 35 needs assessments on faculty and what their, what their needs were surrounding research data management. It will probably come as absolutely no surprise to this particular group that the primary need that they identified was storage. There's a lot of other needs though that we can we can get to. And seeing that at scale, it helps you to understand that everyone is really working on a lot of these same issues. Faculty across the board are, are pretty homogenous in what they're asking for. And then more recently, um, I had the opportunity over the last four years, I built and ran the ACRL RDM Roadshows with Megan Sapp Nelson and an amazing team. And one of the things that Megan and I saw were these different models that our institutions were using to engage liaison and subject librarians in data management and research data services. So we've articulated what these models might look like at your institution. So you'll find things that may look familiar or if you are just getting more involved with data management or you're trying to figure out a different model, we've articulated those for you. Next slide, please. So what does that look like at UIC? As with many institutions, data management and data services falls kind of under that tripartite group of university library, IT and 
the various offices that are aligned with that, and then our Office of Research. And for us specifically, the University Library and the Office of Research, well, that's that's me. <laughs> there are certainly other colleagues that I work with on campus, but I have those titles. That is my primary job responsibility. I'm also a liaison librarian. And then we also have our Information Technology Leadership Council. There is a research committee specifically there. Um, and that group really advocates for the research needs and has a very heavy data focus. We're trying to advocate for the storage needs, for the high performance computing needs. It is a governance group and an advisory group. We gather information. It's really neat because it draws together all of these people from a variety of colleges and experiences. We're doing a lot in terms of education. We do workshops. Um, I teach a full data course. In the spring, we're gonna be working on an NIH data management plan sample library. We respond to a lot of RFIs. I just turned in one last week um, about data to the NIH. So there are a lot of RFIs coming out and it's really essential for us to keep reporting on this. And then we're trying to figure out how do we identify resources that we have in need and working on a data policy development for campus, which is so hard with all the disciplines that we have. Next slide, please. And the thing that's going to be taking up my next year is this new NIH data management and sharing policy. This came out about a year ago and introduces that two-page data management plan into all of the grants. This will start next year in January of 2023, sorry, year, year plus. And it really changes the culture because we're moving from data should be shared. It is nice if you share, you should share to data must be shared. And specifically, as soon as possible and no later than the time of an associated publication or the end of a performance period, whichever comes first. This is an enormous cultural change. We have so many things to tackle and UIC is a huge, we, we get a lot of NIH funding. So trying to make sure our researchers are prepared, this is what I, this is what I am doing. Next slide. So how do I do that? Um, last spring, I went on what I called the awareness tour. I started at administrative as high as I could go and worked my way down. And I was like, hi, hi, here's a new policy. Surprise, um, I'll be back. And just made sure people knew about it. I didn't want this to come as a surprise. I start that second awareness tour with our faculty next spring. I'm doing a couple this December, and but mostly next spring. Really, I want them to hear it over and over again. I don't want this to be a surprise when they hit those fall grants and that fall grant cycle. To that end, we've built a campus task force, which is offices of research and various people from college IT departments. Um, our research technology group, our clinical translational center. And we are really focused on how do we do this in a way that preserves human subject protection. There is specifically in the policy requirements that we observe indigenous data protection. Speaking back to Donna's focus on what they're doing with the care principles, we have to prioritize this, it is in the policy. And then also with AI and machine learning, there's so many new and emergent re-identification risks. And I don't know how we tackle all of those, but we are trying as a campus to make sure that we look at those and consider those holistically now in advance of data sharing. Next slide. And now I will turn it over to Jim. Thanks, Abigail. Uh, my name is Jim Wilgenbush, and I direct research computing at the University of Minnesota. And research computing includes the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute, the Uni University of Minnesota Informatics Institute, and a unit called U-Spatial. Um, I actually report directly to the vice president for research, um, although I work very closely uh, with our libraries here on campus uh, and in the system in general. And so the tack that I'm going to take in terms of just giving a, a bit of an overview is to describe really how the joint task force report fits into a broader vision where really we are looking at ways to view data more as an asset as opposed to a liability. And I'll explain more about what I mean when I talk about data as a, as a liability um, uh, specifically. 
Um, next slide. So all of this that I'm about ready to describe is uh, drawing heavily uh, from a practices and experience in advanced research computing paper, uh, which is cited here. Um, but it also includes a number of updates since this is about two years old. And as, as our uh, panelists already mentioned, things are uh, always in need of being updated. Uh, next slide. So among the things that you've heard already about uh, this particular framework is that um, it's very practical. Um, in fact, there are a number of very specific recommendations with examples uh, that you can look to to see how your institution might be able to uh, take advantage of this report. Uh, this is extremely handy, and this will um, certainly, I think, uh, uh, help you see uh, why we've gone uh, where we went and why we're going in the direction that we're going. Uh, next slide. So um, the, the again, the larger vision uh, is to shift this paradigm from talking about data as a liability to realizing uh, data as an asset. And, and part of that is sort of recognizing that in the role that I play very often amongst technologists, uh, we spend a great deal of time talking about the liability side of the equation. Uh, for example, the cost of allocating storage, the cost of storage itself, and the cost of protecting storage. Um, the real shift should be, uh, and, and what, what we're trying to achieve here at the University of Minnesota, is to uh, not lose sight of the fact that uh, data are also a tremendous asset. Um, that may seem obvious to all of you here, hopefully it does, uh, but to really bringing voice to that is, is what we're aiming to do, um, because of course it promotes public-private collaboration, it helps in recruiting faculty and students, there are economies of scales that can be achieved, um, and certainly it increases our uh, capacity to do high-quality research. Uh, next slide. So I'm not naive though, the challenges are real, as, as all of you know, uh, the breadth of uh, research data is enormous, um, includes you know, socioeconomic data and spreadsheets to you know, very uh, large uh, 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 sets of data that uh, try to describe stellar evolution. Uh, some of these data sets are in fact uh, large. It's fairly common to see data sets uh, over uh, 100 terabytes and, and even to see multi-petabyte data sets that need to be preserved in some way. Um, data use agreements are, are certainly onerous and are not uh, getting any easier to navigate. And our academic institutions are complex. There are many organizations on campus that are involved in, uh, in some way in the data management process. And I'll touch upon a few of those as we go forward. Uh, next slide. So when we started doing this work, really, we identified this was this was really in 2015. So it was prior to this report, and we identified four key ingredients um, to realizing uh, data as an asset. And the first was that there needed to be some sort of sustained research computing infrastructure or research infrastructure. We needed to have well-trained cyber infrastructure professionals. Sometimes these are called cyber practitioners in my community. Um, we needed to have good data governance that spans institutional reporting lines and that really sort of fill that, that middle, if you will. And we needed to have good tools uh, to make data interoperable and to facilitate analysis and sharing of these data. The next slide. I'm just gonna look at one element of this really quickly in the last couple of slides. Um, and that is really the good governance because I think it, it we've really, been helped by uh, the uh, task force report uh, that you were just uh, that you that we're talking about today. Uh, next slide. And I think you know one thing that I just want to say is that everyone at the University of Minnesota was motivated by the reality that if we didn't do something, uh, people are resourceful. Uh, they'll find a way uh, to do things, and the ways that they find to do things. Uh, will vary between um, not particularly elegant to potentially um, uh, dangerous in, in, in various ways or, or risky with respect to the uh, institution. Uh, next slide. All right, so um, the reality that we faced is that, you know, from a top-down 
approach where we're really looking for strategic alignment and so forth. The reality as far as many of our data users and data generators is that could slow things down. And, and from the sort of bottom up approach from the researchers is that um, really they're interested in time to solution and uh, the solutions that come to bear might actually lack broader alignment with our strategic goals. And so uh, next slide. Um, so we really came up with, and this is this is an iterative process. So if you read our paper, you'll see that these this middle looks a little bit differently. We've refined it uh, to include two groups. Uh, the first group is what we call our institutional cyber infrastructure group, and it involves people who directly report up to the vice president to their respective VPs. Uh, and I'll show you who those are in a moment. And then really more of a sort of boots on the ground group, and these are the people who are working directly with the researchers. Uh, next slide. And so um, the charge of this group um, really could be summarized as to coordinate various um, research cyber infrastructure uh, initiatives across the system. Uh, the members of this group, as you've heard in the previous talks, it's important to build effective coalitions. They include uh, research computing or the OVPR, our central IT group, our academic health center, and our, our libraries. Those are the core um, what we call our owners or members of the ISIG. Uh, next slide. It's important to realize that this group also doesn't uh, operate in a vacuum. Uh, we were really uh, initiated with um, the idea of engagement. And so uh, just like uh, within your own institution, uh, you have various groups to engage with and they have already policies and ideas about what needs to be done. And so we've actively engaged with these groups. Next slide. Importantly, I think this approach has allowed us to speak more effectively also with external organizations, both in terms of describing what it is that we're doing, where we're doing is when I speak about the University of Minnesota, I could speak in a more, more coherent fashion, and then also to sort of take that advice and make sure that it enters our institution in an effective way that can affect uh, change. Uh, next slide. And so just quickly back to those recommendations. Where are we? Next slide. We are, we are getting there. Um, specifically, what I tried to do here is map some uh, approaches that we've taken and some results uh, that we've observed to the specific recommendations. Um, those top four um, seem to be very good starting places. Uh, that said, uh, these highlighted in sort of orange and red are ones that we certainly want to get to and actually are putting those on our roadmap now. And that's all I have. Looking forward to, to questions. Here's some resources if you wanted to sort of dive a little bit further into what we're doing. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everybody. I am, uh, again, Jenny Mullenberg, and I'm Research Data Services Librarian at the University of Washington in Seattle. And I'm also an ARL Visiting Program Officer for Research Data. So I'm just gonna kind of uh, illustrate and put an exclamation point on what the speakers have uh, talked about today. So in late 2019, ARL and Carl formed a joint task force on research data services, which had the following three goals, which I won't read to you, but the, the goal of the group was really to um, have a, a selection of deans and directors, as well as data practitioners, data librarians, et cetera, working together to try to come up with um, uh, some, some of the ways that research libraries help steward information and uh, as well as coming up with some support structures and uh, some frameworks for how people can go ahead and not only implement research data services, as you see, as we talked about today, but uh, the policies and strategies that institutions are using. So we tried to create some guidance and um, reference work for uh, research data libraries to use. So there are, there's, well, I'm gonna go back actually. So you, except it's not going back. There we go. The, there's a link there to the actual page on the ARL site that links to the, the report that we have produced. There were also three working groups. The one that dealt with institutional strategies, uh, much of their information was put into the final report itself, but there were two other groups that have forthcoming separate uh, research outputs that are coming our way. So one is on the policy working group. 
or is from the policy working group. And this is the work they did kind of collected a history of policy in the US and Canada and provided an overview of current policies. And then the goal for uh, institutions and librarians was to come up with a list of recommendations when instituting policy and strategy development and implementation. So to do that, we looked at examples of current policies. We included exemplars of library involvement when librarians or libraries had been involved with developing policies and strategies at the institutional level. We've included information about exemplar policies and then some of the selected policy strategies and principles that drive current practice, whether that comes from a government layer or you know, a federal state layer or it's an institutional policy layer. There are also, as you saw with each of these speakers, um, partnerships and having strong relationships with stakeholders is critical to, to having research data services at an institution. And so this particular partner partnerships and stakeholders working group looked at uh, the types of partnerships that exist in providing research data services. I think each one of the three speakers just really highlighted the types of internal and external collaborations that become essential to this kind of, um, not just the institutional strategy and policy development, but the actual impl implementation of services for an institution. This group also looked at the whys of partnerships, which help um, define what, a, what the goals of a partnership is for, whether it's gonna be formal or a more informal basis. They included information about assessment tools, as well as a, a life cycle for partnerships and what partnerships need to succeed. There was also some information about the, uh, a catalog of partnerships, if you will. It, it's All of this is to help people figure out when developing institutional strategies and institutional data services, how to best go about doing them. So some of the next steps and horizon issues for this particular uh, ARL and CARL research data services task force, and then and beyond that particular group, is continued engagement between ARL and CARL on the role of research libraries in RDS. The, um, I'll, I should have said first that the bold are things that we've actually done already. So we've already convened members to talk about some of the NIST standards and their research data uh, services framework. Building upon the AAU and APLU APARD work is another one. We're also working on investigating the open by design approach with regard to indigenous data commu and community expectations. You saw uh, Donna in particular talk about how that's working in Canada. And it's definitely uh, has, has a lot of traction in other institutions as well as in the United States and with some of the individual societies like uh, Research Data Alliance and iAssist, et cetera. Uh, other work that we're doing is examining costs related to public deposit of NSF research. There are always conversations going on about that. Um, as Abigail mentioned, storage is always huge and issues around storage are constantly a moving target. Uh, and then also working with disciplinary societies and repositories on coordinating research data services. This is something we're working on now. And then the last is to hold some more discussions on emerging areas that affect research data services at the institutional level. So we wanted to make sure to leave, oops, we wanted to make sure to leave time for questions. I wanna thank all three of the panelists for helping uh, explain their situation and how things are going at their institution. And I will mute myself and take a look at the chat. Okay, our first question in the chat is, I'm hoping the panel can reflect upon if you all worked with campus administration for contracts and grants, how you engage with those folks for research, proposal planning, development, submission and approval, and for award acceptance set, off, set up and kick off. Hoping this isn't off topic, but it's something we're looking at at UCLA. Um, panelists, does anyone want to address that directly? Well, from, from a high level, um, I think one thing that is maybe germane to other institutions as well are um, sort of compliance, uh, things that are governed by compliance where a funder for, for perhaps um, requires um, uh, a higher compliance sort of rating and CMMC right now in the U.S. for um, defense research in particular is one area that we've been focusing on and really requires um, administrative buy-in uh, to uh, to do effectively. And so um, we have we have certainly engaged across um, various administrative units at a very high level um, to come up with 
uh, an approach actually to um, to implement uh, proposals from uh, from the very you know moment of development all the way through to acceptance um, and closure. And if you're familiar with um, the cybersecurity maturity model certification process, you'll appreciate that it really does demand that degree of coordination. And fortunately, we had this group, the ISIG group in place um, prior to that really becoming uh, a new thing. And I think we were able to effectively assemble the right parties to, um, to address some emerging opportunities. Um, I, I can take things down to a very practical level after Jim's uh, wonderful high level answer. We um, were one of the mandatory tick boxes on the research office um, tick list for researchers before they're able to submit their proposals um, to the Tri-Agency for funding. Uh, it's a list of things they have to have done, thou shalt see the research ethics board, et cetera. And so one of the tick boxes is, uh, do you have a data management plan or have you talked to the RDM librarian? Uh, and that has to be done before they can proceed. And we're kind of in between. Um, I'm not a tick box yet, mostly because there's not enough of me. Um, but we're kind of in between in that where I'm aiming is at the people that are actually doing that work. They need education and training just as much or as more than our researchers do. And I think they're often missed in who needs rates, who needs education, who needs support, who needs checklists, who needs resources. So um, I've been tasked with targeting those groups and making sure that they have support because they can get researchers, then they can do handoff to me or we can make sure that we're connecting people in the best way. We're really trying to work on networks and partnerships. Thank you. Um, if, if there are any other questions, go ahead and put those in the chat. But one of the questions that we, that I'm interested in, and we talked about this a little bit, but um, what mechanisms do you have at your university to encourage informa information sharing around these issues related to data policies and strategies? I think this is key and it kind of gets to the issue of partnerships and collaboration. I can start on this one. So there's the two different committees that I mentioned in my presentation. One was the our information technology governance group, which sees IT people from across campus. That's one easy and frequent place. I see them once a month, no matter what. Um, like next week, I will see the data committee. Now that task force is very much focused on the NIH data management policy. It's so big, it affects us so much. We have, a, we have that targeted task force, but what it has evolved into a little bit is making sure we're getting that relationship sharing. And I think there's a real hunger for that. There's people who've been kind of isolated and am I the only one doing this? The same that we saw all of these needs, needs assessments at different institutions on our own campuses. We see a lot of people who are isolated. They feel like they're alone and being able to say, hey, here's a place, come together and talk about this has really helped with information sharing. We've uh, created um, a digital strategy for Dalhousie. And uh, part of that, one of the biggest recommendations in the strategy is to overhaul the uh, information governance for the whole university, because there are three or four fairly effective tables right now, but they're not really linked or, um, you know, it wasn't constructed from the outset to work as a, a governance structure. So um, that's uh, something that we hope to do in the next year. So when we, when we um, envisioned uh, our institutional cyber infrastructure group and our um, research cyber infrastructure champions, uh, we really uh, had in mind the fact that some, you know, we needed to meet people where they were. And, you know there are researchers and 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 staff who uh, will will really do a great deal of work searching on the web to figure out what the right person is to to talk to and so forth. And there are others who who will not look at the digital 
uh, resources available online and just want to speak with the uh, technical person within their unit. And, and so that's where we sort of came up with this dual strategy of trying to really get a network uh, of individuals. And this is the Research Cyber Infrastructure Champion Network um, across all of our campuses so that wherever someone went, they would quickly come to information that would be, um, you know, more um, perhaps in, impactful in their, in their research, either in terms of finding the resource they need to, to do their research, or if there's a policy issue, quickly get to the policy that's relevant. Thank you, everyone. And I, I've lost track of our time, but I think we're just about at time. So I will pause there and see if there's any other questions from uh, the attendees or from Cliff. And I will also say thank you to our panelists. I don't see any more questions from attendees. Um, so I will just thank you all for a great panel. Um, uh, the, that um, that change that NIH is putting in place, I think, is going to be, as you say, a really big deal. And I, um, I'm very appreciated. I very much appreciated you highlighting that uh, in case there are folks who don't have that on their radar screen yet. Um, thank you all so much uh, for um, joining us today um, and for sharing your thinking on this. Um, thank you all for joining us for the event. Uh, I wish you all a good afternoon or evening, wherever you may be. And um, I look forward to seeing you at 1 Eastern tomorrow for a closing invited session uh, where we're going to talk about how scholarly societies are thinking about the future of meetings, uh, virtual, real, and mixed. So um, with that, I thank our speakers all of our speakers for today, uh, all of our presenters, and I wish you a good evening. Thanks. <laughs>